it's nefarious, man. Like the brain works in fucked up ways. The mind is one of the most deceiving, manipulative pieces of equipment, flesh, human bodies on earth. I never have trusted my brain. All of that weight lives in your head. And you are the decision maker. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Hi, I'm Ronsley. Welcome to this volume of the Psychology of Entrepreneurship. Is this the first volume you're listening to? We're calling it volumes rather than episodes, by the way. I'd love to know if you listen to others and what do you think about it. This is an audio project that has taken a few things to fall together before coming apart and then coming together in this perfect moment. Today's episode was the first interview I did on the psychology of entrepreneurship. It was my baptism of fire. We were in Austin, Texas. It was a 30 minute drive from where we were staying to where I was doing the interview. And Rochelle and I didn't speak for the whole drive there. And then we get to this gate that fences the whole neighborhood. We punch in the code and drive another, say, seven minutes. Then we get to the door and knock. Someone opens this gigantic door to the left of us, but kind of behind us a little bit, and yells, Dude, that's the guest house. To say I was nervous was an understatement because I was talking with. My name's Tucker Max. I'm the founder of Scribe Media, I've written four New York Times best selling books, and here I am on Ronsley's podcast, The Psychology of Entrepreneurship. And one of the first questions I decided to ask him while my wife watches me work for the first time was, Hey, Tucker. Do you consider yourself to be an entrepreneur? I mean, yeah, of course. Like, just as a matter of fact, I've, I've definitely started a bunch of businesses. So, I mean, an entrepreneur, I think, plainly put, is someone who uh, solves a problem in which a way that other people are willing to pay for it, and they are willing, or they are able to capture some of that money. You know, like that's pretty much it. Everything else is just explanation. I was like red in the face because my body just heard what a dumbass question that was just up front. But you couldn't tell that I was red in the face because my skin doesn't change that color. I wonder what my heart rate was like. Anyway, less about me. In the early days of when the concept of this show was coming together, I was really caught up in the word entrepreneurship. Like, should that even be in the title? So I asked a lot of questions around how others defined business and who was an entrepreneur. At its core, business should be uh, and generally is when you are creating value either by giving giving someone something they want or solving a problem they have that's valuable enough they're willing to pay you more than the opportunity cost of your time, right? And all in, that's what a that's what business is. All an entrepreneur is is someone who starts a business from nothing. Of course, everyone would have their definitions of different words. For example, if I said I went to church this Sunday, someone would think, "Oh, Ronsley is such a good boy," and someone else might think, "I'm just a fool for still believing that religion is real." It's all based on one's definitions. I think, and this is a Ronsley definition, entrepreneurs create value by doing remarkable things. They have to find a way to exchange that value for them to keep doing that remarkable thing. A lot of people are entrepreneurs that think they aren't. For example, moms. I believe mothers are the original entrepreneurs when you think about all the things that mothers balance. It's quite remarkable. Or an athlete with their own brand and training schedules and sponsors and fans, or an artist, even someone in an organization that has changed the system to suit their lifestyle by exchanging value in a different way, like uh, negotiating a four-day week for the same amount of pay because they deliver results. I think they're called intrapreneurs. But in Australia, the term used for founder, business owner, entrepreneur is small business owner. Uh, like it used to be in America that small business owner was not a term of disparagement, but it was just kind of like no one thought much of it. And then uh, the kind of the the tech, the internet kind of blew up, and the tech scene blew up, and 
and you can't call the guys who start Yahoo or Google small business owners, right? And and they're but they're not really they weren't at the time titans of business, right? So what do you entrepreneurs? They they start businesses and it became a whole culture of starting businesses. Um and and so that's kind of taken off. Like yeah. that's most of American development and change and growth over the last 30 to 40 years has been driven by entrepreneurship, you know, uh, not all by any stretch, but a huge portion of it, um, has been, uh, but yeah, no dude, it's, it's, it, business is about solving problems or get, or meeting needs. Entrepreneurs are the people who start that stuff. Okay, at this stage, I'm thinking, come on, Ronsley, get it together. You've done about 800 interviews. And I start to ask smarter questions like, what did this guy think about the fastest way that we as entrepreneurs get stuck or put ourselves in these sticky positions? The fastest way to get stuck where you are is to congratulate yourself for what you've done, you know? Or just spend a lot of time doing that. Like, I don't dismiss it, but I also don't spend much time thinking about it or caring about it because, yeah. like, it's done. It's in the past. Good or bad, it's done. Yeah. And, um, like, what I care about today are my kids, right? And my family and uh, uh, my company and the people in my house right now, right? And things like that. Like, that's what I care about. That's what matters. Um, but, like... No, I don't, I don't, there's time enough for me to, there will be time enough for me to congratulate myself for my accomplishments when I'm dead, you know, like in the meantime, I've got a lot more stuff I want to do. Right. So enough about how many interviews you've done, Ronsley. Fuck. Okay, so I came into this interview just kind of going through a growth spurt myself where everyone was telling me to slow down. That all I was doing and thinking about was my creations and how other people would think about them and receive them. And I really needed to stop and smell some roses or something to that effect. And then Tucker said something about the hunger inside these people that really got my attention. Like, I forget who said this. One of the quickest ways to ruin someone is to give them too much success too early, right? And so, like, uh, I was uh, William the, William Goldman, the screenplay writer. It was he, I'm, par- I'm paraphrasing, but it was something like that. And um, uh, it's true, man. I've seen all kinds of people I know hungry, really want to either make a difference or make money or do a company or do something cool, whatever it is. They're hungry, right? They're, they're poor, broke, and hungry. And that kind of drives them, and then they get some success, or they get an exit, and then they're done. They they they're gone because the only thing that was actually driving them was their their hunger, right? Which is not in and of itself a bad thing, right? I don't mean to disparage that, but like, if that's the only thing driving you, then yeah, when you succeed, you're gonna just stop because you're not hungry anymore for that, right? Yeah. Um, but if you're doing something because you love doing it and because you love the value that you, you know, you want to create value for others and you want to, you know, uh, self-actualize, then success is cool, but it's not really the reason you do it. You know, if that's the only thing driving you, then yeah, when you succeed, you're going to just stop because Forty-two percent of small businesses fail because there isn't a definite market need for their particular business. I have to say that I've been really blessed in doing what I love and loving what I'm doing. Every stage of my life just seems to be one awesome ride. That awesome ride, though, makes my stomach turn so much that on some days the room corner in fetal position feels like the safest place in the world. Thankfully now, my head on Rochelle's lap works way better. So what drives you then? What is your passion or mission? For the most part, it's going to be about you. That's why you're doing it, right? Now, I'm, I'm not saying some people aren't driven by their mission. Um, some people are. 
But it's easy to conflate those two and a lot of people convince themselves it's about mission when really it's about I'm going to show daddy or whatever, right? Um, I definitely know people who I think maybe started to fill a void but then they 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 kind of accomplished what they were looking for and it wasn't satisfactory and so then how do you keep going? That's when you have to truly reach back and make it about the mission and the, the, the who you're helping, right? So that's the difference between the people who succeed once and the people who keep going. If you succeed once and stop, it's because it was only about like filling the hole, right? If you have to, if you keep going, usually it's because you realize that you're never going to fill that hole with success with anything external that has to be internal and then you go on that journey and then it's like, all right, I want to do what I can to help others. Um, that's a pretty natural transition. Um, not everyone makes it. <laughs> so Tucker's saying. That's when you have to truly reach back and make it about the mission and the, the, the who you're helping, right? Reminded me about Dr. Sherry Walling in volume two when she said. So the way to deal with imposter syndrome is to sort of realize it's not fucking about you. In my interviews, I noticed a trend where probably the number one solution most experts gave me on dealing with imposter syndrome was to stop focusing on ourselves and start focusing on the why. The stats on how many small businesses fail has been no secret. It is a lot. For every success story, there are a hundred failed ones. For every Michelin chef, there are ones that started restaurants that didn't really work out. I have definitely contributed to that stat. No one wants to be part of that stat. But what if it was all part of the journey? What if there was no right or wrong, good or bad, success or failure? What if accepting that there is both is just step one? The longer you wait to pay a bill, the more the interest is, man. Same thing, like the, the, the longer you refuse to embrace your shadow self, like the dark things in you that you don't want to admit, the worse they become, always. 100%, man, without any doubt or hesitation. Yeah, that's the way it works. I started to remember all those instances with things repeating in my life. And all this was going on in my brain while I was trying to have this insanely, what has just suddenly just become interesting kind of conversation. I also remembered situations of people in dysfunctional relationships and boring jobs. Why do we do things if that is not in our best interest? And why does that keep repeating in our lives? Here, I'll give you a great story. So uh, this is a, a parable. This didn't literally happen, but like, Imagine you're, you you walk up to a, a porch, an old porch, right? And there's an old man in his rocking chair on the porch, and there's a dog next to him. The dog's whining, right? And like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, like whining. And uh, and so you ask, like, hey man, wh why is your dog whining? He goes, oh well, he's sitting on a nail. And it's like, well, why doesn't he move? And the old man says, well, when the pain gets real bad or bad enough, he'll move. You know, that's most people, dude. They would prefer the pain that they know because it's safe, it's comfortable, uh, and in a weird way, it becomes it becomes a piece of their identity, right? Uh, that suffering does, right? Because they know it and it's who they are, uh, and then a lot of ways they'll internalize that. They're like, well, if I'm suffering, I must deserve it, right? And so, like, um, uh, they... That's that's kind of how it works, and most people would not. To then stop that is to have to reevaluate who you are and your identity, but then also go into the unknown, you know. And that's the unconscious is deeply afraid of the unknown. Oh, the unknown again. So if someone really feels like an imposter, they've got to fake it till you make it. The main objective of this audio documentary is to bring together entrepreneurs and creatives who share similar values in a place where conversations can be had without judgment. A place where our listeners can give us constructive feedback 
to improve the show with topic and guest recommendations. For access to this space, go to mustamplify.com slash POE and click the button. 77% of small businesses in 2018 were funded personally, making that the most popular method of financing the startup of a business for that year. So imposter syndrome is when you think, I, I literally am not the thing that people think I am, which is different than thinking you're not good enough, right? They're, they're, they seem similar, but they're not exactly the same. Fake it so you make it doesn't work. It's bullshit. There is one situation where it does work, actually. It is really good advice for people that have imposter syndrome. Wait, what? Okay, so think about it. If you actually can, like, let's just, I'm going to make something up. Uh, Ron, let's say that you, um, you're you actually a great surfer, right? Let's say you're really truly an excellent surfer, but you have imposter syndrome. So you think you're not. You think you suck, right? So then what I would tell you is, and this is actually, I'm going to repitch Todd Herman's book, Alter Ego Effect. This, he talks about this a lot. And he's a very specific strategy for doing this. I've interviewed Todd for this series and it's coming up in later weeks. Sorry, Taco, you, you were saying. But it basically boils down to pretend you are a good surfer. Right? So fake it till you make it works if you're faking yourself into believing your actual skill set. Then it works beautifully. Right? So that's why for a lot of guys who are really nervous around girls but could do well if they would just talk to them, fake it till you make it actually works. Because they, I can't tell you how many guys, I literally have thousands of emails like this where guys, um, I mentioned this in a book. I'm like, guys, if you're, actually, if you, if you're half decent looking and can speak, just pretend you're me when you go out talking to girls and you're going to do 10 times better than you are now. Like jokingly, I've had thousands of emails from guys who are like, oh my God, that worked amazingly, right? And not because like they were me at all. They just, they, they in their head, they said, well, how would Tucker talk to this girl? Confidently, brashly, he'd walk right up to her, be assertive, he'd say something funny. So they go be their version of me, which probably nothing like me, right? In fact, the ones that try to act the most like me are the ones who bomb. But the ones who like just, take me, I'm going to be confident and assertive, they do amazing. And then they're fine after that because now they've proven to themselves they can actually do it. That's the only way fake it till you make it works. Uh, If you don't have the skills, right? Like let's say say that you are a stuttering doofus, right? If you pretend you're me and you go, hi, hi, the girls will be like, what's wrong with you, you weirdo? <laughs> it doesn't matter how much you fake. You can't like, right? So that, that's how fake it till you make it work. So it's actually, it's funny you bring up imposter syndrome. That's the perfect advice for it. Interesting advice here. Tucker isn't suggesting that if you can't do something, you fake doing that thing until you can do it. He's saying that if you already climb the mountain and you are climbing a similar mountain and if you aren't sure you can do it and you sell yourself short, that's when this comes into play. And Todd Herman's book, The Alter Ego Effect, is phenomenal in giving you a proven strategy to deal with the imposter. I spent two hours chatting with Todd in his office in Manhattan, and his volume will be published later this year. With the mind, we can tell ourselves all sorts of stories and make up all sorts of scenarios. For me, what most people aren't, the lie most people tell themselves is I'm happy. If you ask most people, are you happy? They'll say, yeah. And they're all fucking miserable. All of them. Why do they believe they're happy though? Because they have to tell themselves that. Because if they don't, everything collapses for them. Do they know they're miserable? Are they even conscious that they're there? Of course they know. Of course they know. They know. You, they might not, they, they, most of them would, a lot of them would deny it if you pre- most people, if you press them, they'll admit it, right? If you know them, they'll admit it. But a lot of people will deny it for a long time. Usually, the more successful they are, the more they'll deny it, right? Like poor people got no problem being like, "No, nah, it sucks," you know. Like poor people. That's my favorite part, man. About like, like it's it's like the more marginalized you are, generally the better adherence to to your hard reality you have to face. You know, it's because when you're poor, you can't pretend. You know, if there's no food on the table, there's no lying about that. Whereas if you have an, a nice house and food on the table and whatever, it's easy to tell yourself a lot of bullshit stories for a long time. But when you can't eat, 
You can't argue with that, man. It's like we say in, in MMA, on the mats, the truth finds you, right? It's the same thing. Hunger, the truth finds you. Cold, the truth finds you. Rain, you know, like you, if you can't pay your heat bill or your light bill or you got a hole in your roof or there's nothing in your refrigerator, where, where's the lie there? Do you have an activity in your life where the truth will find you? Running a business and leading a team are definitely activities for me that point out the truth. Also climbing, rock climbing. Most people think that the goal in climbing is to get to the top of the climb. For me, climbing is about my body learning individual moves that it could not do before and then stitching it all up together to get to the top of that climb without letting the noise in my head cripple me by telling me how I'm going to fall and die. <laughs> Just for the record, climbing is a safe sport. 99% of climbers would never put themselves in fatal positions where a fall would kill them, at least the ones that I know. I'm pretty sure of it. Remember how I loved my geek out session on psychology history when Dr. Sherry Walling told me about the origins of imposter syndrome and the work of Alfred Adler in volume two? I knew Tucker loved his history, especially Adler. The three titans of European uh, 20th century psych psych uh, psychology were Freud. Everyone knows Freud. Young, most people know Young, and Adler, and most people don't know Adler. So uh, Freud was the unconscious and was uh, essentially, I don't want to say invented, discovered the unconscious and really kind of like helped the world understand that like this exists, right? And Jung was like the one who kind of explored it and, you know, because Freud was stuck with a lot of weird ideas about the unconscious. Jung was the one who really explored it and was like, okay, there are archetypes and that we're connected in this way and blah, blah, blah. Adler was the one basically who said, and I'm like, I'm not, I'm grossly oversimplifying his ideas. But basically what he said was, none of that matters. Like, uh, and he didn't mean that literally, but what he meant was more like... Adler's difficult to understand, though. He is. No, I would highly recommend reading the book, The Courage to Be Disliked, which is these two Japanese, or a Japanese guy, two Japanese guys, did like a synthesis of his ideas that's way easier for most people to understand. But the basic idea is that you choose all your actions. And, so, and you choose to keep emotions, and you choose to keep... Uh, feeling certain things, right? And so, like, most people, you know, like, they, that's just anathema. Like, they're, what are you talking about? Like, I didn't choose anger and this and that. But the way he explains it, he's actually right. Like, you do. Uh, you know, like, uh, you you have to every single time, even if it's not a conscious choice, you're still, at, at the end of the day, you're making a choice. Uh, and so his basic hypothesis was that the past, in a weird way, the past doesn't actually matter because you can choose every moment how to act. But Philip said, My work and what I believe is if you want to understand who you are at the core, intellectually and emotionally, there's only one place to go and that is into your past. That is the place that holds every key to who you are and who you're going to be, whether you like it or not. I know what you're thinking right now. Does the past matter? There is a lot of mixed messages here, Ronsley. Yes, there is. And there always will be. It is really important to hear it all digest it all and then make up your own mind as Tucker continues to geek out on Adler. Now, there are certain things I think Adler missed about um, uh, like how the unconscious connects to emotions and whatever, which I, well, I know he missed because he died in like whatever, the 60s or, or something before we really understood all this stuff. But the core tenets of his ideas are really, really good. And the basic idea is that you have to be fully accountable for yourself and your emotions, but not expect anything from anyone else because that's all your projection right and um that's one of those ideas you really have to explore a lot in depth it sounds it's not it's it's hard to talk about on a podcast so i wanted to ask tucker's advice for anyone that is looking to start their entrepreneurship journey now that's very simple if you're trying to start a company first off don't think of the company the only thing you have to think of is how do i solve how do i get get someone something they want um or solve a problem they have in a way where they will pay me uh and i can capture some of that they'll pay for it and i'll capture that value that's it it's just an exchange of value so you're going to give someone your time or your product right so you need them to pay you more than it costs you okay that sounds simple why do we fail at businesses so often then the most entrepreneurs fail 
They fail because they're, they're making it about them. Your business, your product, your service is not about you. No one gives a fuck about you. They care about themselves. So make something that will help them enough that they will pay you more than it, than it costs you to give it to them. Yeah. Boom. Done. Yeah. It is simple to understand. It may not be easy for everyone to apply, but it is dead simple. Definitely not easy to apply. My first business failed and I had a master's in business administration before I started that one. I just could not work out the business model for the exchange of value in a way that allowed me to capture any of the difference that Tucker was talking about. My first business was a fresh food restaurant. And in Australia, the three main things that work against you from day one are, one, uh, once you have the location, you have to make do with that location for the duration of the lease you've signed. I mean, you can do your research and check the location out and do all sorts of back checking, but you only really know the true value of a location and the foot traffic around it once you're in the place. Two, when you buy fresh food in Australia, you don't pay any goods and services tax or GST. Um, we don't, Australia doesn't charge GST on fresh food. But when you cook those ingredients and you sell them, you, you pay a 10% tax to the government um, of GST, which means you're losing 10% without even selling yet. And number three, the wage bill in Australia is really high because of the minimum wage is really high. All these things are, are, are facts that I had no idea about, and I had to make the hard mistakes to learn those lessons. Yeah. I definitely made things complicated. It's not about speed. It, 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 people don't get it because most people want to make everything complicated. Most people are looking for the complicated answer. Most people, if they, if most people, here's the thing: if it's simple to understand, then they have to actually go do it. And that's scary, right? So, execution is scary. Execution is tough. I didn't say I didn't say it's simple to do. It's simple to understand. It's not easy to do, but if if you, if it, if you make it difficult to understand, then you don't have to get started, then you don't ever have to fail. There you go. What would you do differently, Tucker, if you could do it again? I'll tell you what I would do different, man. I would spend five times more time and effort on hiring. We had to fire 11 of our first 13 employees and probably 20 of our first 30, which is disastrous waste of time and money i would have spent way way more time really dialing in on hiring and just like getting that right how are you hiring now now that we have the core team the way we have our interview process set up works really well because like our interview process works like an immune system you know like you gotta you gotta get past like six people in the team and there's no way you're getting past six of us if you're wrong Right. And so like and it's not sequential. It's like the first two are kind of filters and then you come in for a f for an office visit. It's like four or five people. So like you can't hide from five people. Six. It's totally different. You know, the young women, old women, young guys, young guys or old guys, whatever. It's like a whole all different experiences. Do So there's no one is getting through if you aren't really well equipped. I don't know how we would have replicated that earlier. I would have had to find a way, man, but I would have spent the time to figure it out. You know, part of this growth as an entrepreneur is delegating and leading that delegation, then delegating that delegation and so on. I suppose it depends whether that is where we'd like to go in the first place. The way I see it, I'm only a juvenile in my entrepreneurship journey and I've got so much more to learn and so much more to experience. Failing and succeeding is part of that journey. At least I'm convincing myself that coming up on the psychology of entrepreneurship. Hi, this is Dave Meltzer, and I'm best known for the CEO that goes around the world helping people. The first thing you should do every day is figure out how you stay in business tomorrow, because if you stay in business long enough, you're going to be more and more successful. So, you know, I look always within my own self, and one of the biggest tragedies that I've had to overcome was understanding my own worthiness, right? So worthiness is the key to the imposter syndrome.
and here's the thing. Uh, I'm only 43. I got at least a good 30 years left. Um, and uh, the only thing I'm really afraid of, um, or I should put it this way, my definition of hell is that when I die, the man I am meets the man I could have become. Right. And so that's the thing I'm trying to make sure doesn't happen. Psychology of I interviewed Tucker because he has sold 3 million copies of his book worldwide. He has been on the New York Times bestseller list for the longest time, I think six years, if I'm correct. Uh, simultaneously having three books on that New York Times bestseller list as well. Nominated on Times Magazine's 100 Most Influential list is the founder of Scribe Media. He graduated college in just three years with highest honors and went to Duke Law School on an academic scholarship. This guy has really reinvented himself from being a playboy of sorts to a high-performing entrepreneur. This is a Must Amplify production. Special thanks to every guest expert that has appeared on the show. Editing and sound design by Jay Gallison. Voiceover by Sonia Stone. Fact voiceover by Kaylee Bunnyman. Guest research and content by Claire Gould. Project managed by Shannon Morrison. Produced and hosted by me, Don Slivaz. For more episodes and where to listen, go to mustamplify.com slash P-O-E. Hey, 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 it's Jake from Must Amplify. I'm the sound engineer for this volume of The Psychology of Entrepreneurship. I'm a part of the team that made this production come alive. I work as a part of a global team with our studios and headquarters based in West End, Brisbane, Australia, the land of the drop bear. For more about the cool stuff we're up to and to work out of our studios, go to mustamplify.com. You still listening? Thanks for sticking around. Here's a little gift for you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is take two. In case uh, it's not on the record, Jake fucked up. I mean, yeah, of course. Just like as a matter of fact. Oh, that's him. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do, Tucker, if you could do... do- ah.